throughout the bleak horrors which pockmark the empire of humanity as it exists in the 41st millennium lie individuals with ambitions so dangerous, guilt so all-consuming or ignorance so diabolical that they must be exterminated as quickly and as gruesomely as possible. I'll be looking across several episodes at individual elements of the Officio Assassinorum, their individual disciplines, and in one likely summarising those we know little to anything about. As should be clear to all by now, managing the Galactic Imperium is not something that is easily handled both logistically and in other ways, like shifting ideological views and those with grandiose plans for self-enrichment or power grabs. For the Imperium to function, it requires those trusted in positions of absolute authority to quite literally dictate the order of things. This is bolstered by the most powerful and loyal of its military forces and factions. At a blunt face value, what this means is a powerful combination of bodies and hardware, titanic war machines, genetic superhuman warriors, and starships that are capable of literally ending the lives of entire planets. But I'm sure to the sadness of some of you, believe it or not, Exterminatus is not the only way to ensure loyalty. There are still more subtle ways to contain those problematic individuals of humanity, crazed governors, cells of dissidents and corrupted cults, those who simply have the ego and audacity, who believe they're able to defy the will of terror and live. Yes, there is the Inquisition, but when you need less of a club and more of a scalpel, there exists the Officio Assassinorum. Indeed, in many ways, the assassins of the Imperium are what might be termed diplomacy in the 41st millennium. Within the darkness of the galaxy of 40k, you are less likely to find yourself sitting around a table discussing the ins and outs of who's right and who's wrong. If you're assigned a position of power, you will be expected to fall firmly within the boundaries laid out by those in the higher bureaucracy, because failure to do so could well mean one day a Vindicare assassin placing a precision round through the base of your skull, leaving your body dead before your brain were even able to process this fact. The assassin's battleground is that of the misguided and the ambitious, the heretic, the fool, and those foul individuals perverted by diabolical corruptions. All must be exterminated in the eyes of the Imperium, lest their diseased minds and actions spread further throughout the Emperor's glorious domain. The Order of Imperial Assassins is known as the Officio Assassinorum, and dates back to the period around the dawn of the Emperor's Great Crusade upon Mount Vengeance, where the Emperor would infamously give a speech to his followers declaring, that no world shall be beyond my rule, no enemy shall be beyond my wrath. Now I will not be getting sidetracked by thoughts about the Emperor and his agenda today, but of course this is a very famous line and you should interpret his words and later actions as you will. But here is where the first members of the Officio Assassinorum made their oath and pact against the enemies of the Emperor and mankind, to hunt them down mercilessly using their refined skills of stealth and subterfuge. The group of the Officio Assassinorum had been formed with fragile rules that were reliant upon anonymity and secrecy. It could only exist as long as its strict rules which bound its existence were followed by all of its members. In this earliest of times, there were no assassin temples, they were simply known as clades. Each clade leader was known as a director primus, and they answered to the master of assassins, who, unbeknownst to them, beyond being a high lord of terror, was of course Malkador the Sigilite. Constantine Valdor of the Custodes was also aware of the goings-on within the Assassinorum at this time, and this enclave of assassins would all meet within the Imperial Palace on Terror. The Imperial Palace, it should be noted, is far beyond the scale of what we might imagine today as being a city palace. It was the most grandiose cityscape at the heart of all humanity, and it stretched from horizon to horizon. It is said to have been of a size that may have equaled an entire continent. And here, somewhere lost within the darkened corners of the metropolis, is where the original Officio Assassinorum would meet, in a location known as the Shrouds. Here they were entirely locked away in a vault that should not have existed and could not be monitored by any means from the outside. For those who were able to enter the chamber, to all intents and purposes, from that moment until they made their exit, they ceased to exist. For decades they served the Emperor and the Master of Assassins, hunting down those who would bring ruination to the Emperor's plans, striking down those who sought to undermine his glorious vision for mankind. 
They sought no praise, no glory, no word of appreciation from the emperor himself. They felt themselves unworthy of such adulation and moved silently in the wake of the Great Crusade. They made sure that those worlds newly brought into the Imperium kept their word and that their treaties were abided by. Yet even the Clades Primus were unable to escape the inevitable. Death would stalk them eternally just as it did their designated targets and so they came to realise that they must pass on their skills to create a legacy of Imperial assassins. In doing so, they revealed themselves to the Emperor, and he was greatly pleased with their accomplishments. Great temples to each clade were then constructed upon terror, and as within all branches of the Imperium's military forces, the most skillful, the most deadly youths were sought for initiation into the Officio Assassinorum. These foundations laid ensured that even some 10,000 years later, the Emperor's most deadly followers reach out to enact his wrath upon those who might seek to deny him. When a heresy fell upon the burgeoning Imperium, they were tasked with achieving the unachievable and were set to assassinate the arch-traitor Horus Lupercal, the War Master. They failed. But through their actions were established the temple disciplines of the Officio Assassinorum as we know them to this day. For a significant period after the Horus heresy, the Imperium still lay in ruin, quite literally in chaos, as many worlds were still tearing themselves apart. Scandal would later surround the Assassinorum in mid-M32 when an event known as the Beheading would take place. The mutually destructive decisions being made by the then High Lords of Terror took a horrific path when they were slain by assassins by the orders of Draken Van Gorich, who was serving Grand Master of the Assassinorum. An Astartes retribution force drawn from Halo Brethren, Imperial Fists and Sable Swords tracks down Van Gorich to an Assassinorum temple. The Space Marine Commander is slain as soon as the Strike Force lands, but the Marines engage regardless. A true nightmare ensues, as upon entering the temple, the Astartes are assaulted by anywhere by around 100 Eversor assassins. When the slaughter was over, only a single badly wounded Space Marine survives the horror, but by some miracle is able to kill the Grand Master, purging him with the Emperor's Wrath. There's a lot of Emperor's Wrath going on today. The result of all this is that the Imperium descends into anarchy for the next century as a destructive power struggle ensued over who should rule the Imperium. Finally, Agnathio, then Chapter Master of the Ultramarines, unites over 50 leaders from the other chapters of Space Marines and arrives upon Terra. Such a show of power and faith puts an end to the squabbling for the contentious seats of the High Lords of Terra that has consumed the differing factions since the beheading, and it is here that in a locked council with the mightiest of mankind's warriors, including very likely, of course, the Custodes, this destructive period is quickly resolved. None can know just exactly how the decisions were made, but when the Astartes departed, there sat again 12 High Lords of Terra. Should any of the bureaucrats, nobles or warmongers who had sought ultimate power for themselves felt the need to dissent, there were none who dared to voice it. But then came the Astropath Wars and the Firestorm, the details of which are barely documented, but out of all of this would eventually rise the Adeptus Ministrorum. Several millennia later in M36, the Ministrorum as it was sought to exert its power over the Imperium. All entered into the Age of Apostasy. The Officio Assassinorum was no exception, and fractures in its hierarchy were shown. Now this period is very complex and contains a great many different threads, which if I went off on would lead to an extremely long video. But one figure is closely associated with this period, that being Goge Van Dyer. And it is known that he had a reputation for abusing the power of the assassins for his own ends. Indeed, not only was he said to have gained his position by the use of assassins, but also that any who would later speak out against him were regularly found to then either disappear or found dead in very gruesome or mysterious circumstances. As a result, soon there would be few who would speak against him. Although Van Dyer resisted the dominance within the Ecclesiarchy at this time, he would eventually take control of it, wielding both the power of the Administratum and the Ecclesiarchy, and it would soon become fairly evident that Van Dyer was an insane sociopath and was essentially power mad. Whenever a circumstance presented itself to be twisted, he would manipulate it to support his arguments. A fleeing ship of high-ranking Ecclesiarchy being lost in the warp, for example, was used by Van Dyer to bolster his claims that he had the Emperor on his side. And this insanity of Van Dyer gave rise to what were known then as the Daughters of the Emperor, 
an all-female cult dedicated to the worship of the Emperor. They served as Vandaya's personal army, and you may well imagine who this cult would later transform into as a militant wing of the Ecclesiarchy. But what, of course, of the assassins? Well, under Goj Vandaya's bloodthirsty purging of the Imperium, and those who might threaten him, the Officio Assassinorum came well within the scope, if you care for the pun, of Vandaya's paranoia. This was likely well justified as the assassins had generally been designed to prevent just such kind of maniacs from taking control. One might wonder why this took so long for them to get a handle on given that Vandaya had been already well known as a disruptive and problematic individual. The Grand Master of the Assassins would later speak to this in a letter to the Inquisition where he took the blame for the failings within the Officio Assassinorum and lamented his foolishness in thinking that he could alone dig out the seeds of corruption and stamp them out. Vandaya had established something of a following within the Assassinorum. And just as he had in many factions and organisations across the Imperium, he achieved this largely through both bribery, blackmail, or just simply pure corruption. One of his most prized agents was Ziz Jarek, who had felt cheated by the then standing Grand Master. Using the shape-shifting powers made possible by the drug polymorphine that the Calidus Temple are well known for, Jarek was able to corrupt other temples within the Assassinorum that would ultimately lead to an insurrection. When the sudden death of Vandaya came at the hands of his former guardians, the Daughters, it soon became clear to Jarek that as many sections of the Administratum were being purged of any association with Vandaya, the same would very likely soon be true for the Officio Assassinorum, who were entirely unforgiving of misjudgement and failures even if they were unwitting. And so Jarek would assassinate the Grand Master and take his place. However, one does not simply become Grand Master of the Officio Assassinorum, without some slight understanding of the threats that are present to you. And so the Grand Master was in fact prepared for just such an action against him. He had well foreseen that Jarek would make these conclusions about the purging taking place, and that it would lead Jarek to attempt to seize control. And so the Grand Master had in fact switched himself with an identical double. Still very much alive, the Grand Master then gathered loyal assassins and assaulted the temples on terror. Jarek may have been occupying the position of Grand Master through the use of polymorphine, but only the true Grand Master held the codes to unleash the terrifying Eversor assassins, as well as the identities of all assassins, and access to some of the most devastating weaponry in the Imperium. The subsequent battle was to bring the Officio Assassinorum to its knees. The Grand Master saw that it must be entirely broken before the eyes of the Imperium, for if it could so easily be corrupted, then it was no longer fit for purpose, and was more of a threat than a safeguard for the Imperium. Eversor assassins stalked through pitch corridors hunting the renegades. Vindicare snipers lay in vents and perched atop Imperial masonry, picking off the traitors with invisible impunity. Suspected strongholds and hideouts were destroyed with demolitions so powerful, entire sections of the Imperial Palace were collapsed. The fighting became so furious and bloodthirsty that it eventually spilled out into the Imperial Palace itself. An unseemly spectacle, to be sure. The ancient arsenal of Forbidden and Xenos weaponry was opened up, and gene-sympathetic nerve gases polluted the corridors of the Imperial Palace, while neutronic warheads destroyed whole wings of the ancient structures. The traitor assassins, whether they knew it or not, were being steadily eliminated, until Jarek and the Grand Master faced the final confrontation. Jarek felt confident, perhaps overconfident, in his attempt to murder the Grand Master, wielding such war gear as a neural shredder, which is just as it sounds, and a terrible Xenos weapon in what is known within the Kaladas Temple as the Katarn Phase Sword. This is made of the material known only to the Necron, and is able to bypass all shields given its nature of phasing in and out of real space. Yet as the two began to engage one another, the Grand Master had readied a trap. A haywire grenade exploded within the chamber, and Jarek saw in horror his tools of assassination were now neutralised, and tearing an Exodus pistol from the wall, the Grand Master dropped the traitor with two fast shots, the first in the head and the second in the chest. The rounds were made to dissolve, and the Master replaced the pistol with fresh unfired ammunition, placing it back on the wall. When all was said and done, the true Grand Master had rid the Imperium and Officio Assassinorum of Jarek, but would then vanish into a self-imposed exile. What became of him past this point, or if he could still be even alive somewhere, is entirely unknown. On Terra, the body of the Grand Master's double had been found, and a package delivered to the Inquisition containing the signet ring of the Grand Master of the Assassins, or so it appeared, as well as a note explaining the situation. 
The Inquisitors noted that the true Grand Master's ring should contain a data crystal, and if it were true, then that on the body would be found in fact with a replica of the Grand Master's ring. This was confirmed to be accurate, and so led them to conclude that this was in fact not the true Grand Master's body. The Inquisition set out to further explore this situation. The data crystal contained a code to an administratum vault, but locating it to begin with was a problem in and of itself. The administratum has vast realms of vaults on Terra, and finding it could in fact take years. So in order to find a specific vault, the Imperium will use archive servitors. These are linked to a memory unit which holds locations of the majority of Imperial vaults. They input three servitors with the code, but only one was able to locate the vault itself, and this still took two weeks for it to accomplish. It had travelled some 50 kilometres within what are loosely the United Planetary Spanning Hives on Terra. Within this, they found yet another body of a Grand Master. He was suspended in stasis, yet even this proved to be another false Grand Master. More importantly was a highly detailed document revealing to the Inquisition the full account of the highly disturbing and widespread corruption within the Officio Assassinorum written by the Grand Master, with words stating that his final hope was that now having absolved himself in front of the Emperor, only he should now judge whether he deserved everlasting peace. In the aftermath of the carnage, the Inquisition was significantly troubled by these events and revelations, and so it would create the Ordo Sicarius, at the behest of Inquisitor Jaeger, and from the ending of the War of Vindication, the Ordo Sicarius has since monitored and overseen the Officio to theoretically ensure that such another terrible war can never take place again. One thing was sure though, the Inquisition saw that the truth of what had occurred during the Wars of Indication were sealed for all time. They made it known that the Grand Master had been slain, and that the High Lords made sure they would retain control of the Officio Assassinorum, and that from here on, only the traitor heretic and corrupted need ever fear the Imperial Assassin. This all sounds very well and good on the face of it, but a devil's advocate might argue that it were questionable whether placing an order of the Inquisition in charge of Imperial Assassins was a particularly wise move given their shifting and sometimes troubling ideology. But I'm sure that that could never be a problem down the road, to be sure. It'll be fine. It will all be fine. For eight days he had lain absolutely still and undetected, tensing and releasing each muscle in turn to keep himself ready for action. So subtle were his movements that not a single leaf stirred and the red feathered birds nesting above continued to feed their young undisturbed. Exhaling slowly, he released his conscious mind, using his well-honed instincts to sense the armoured tower in the distance where his prey still hid. The self-declared prophet Elysia would have to speak to his people soon, and when he did, the Vindicare would be ready. As dawn broke, the assassin's sensors picked up the swish of thick curtains in the tower. Far away on the tower's balcony, Elijah stood with arms outstretched to welcome the morning sun. As he watched through the sight of his long rifle, the assassin carefully loaded his specialised ammunition. Seconds later, a flash of crackling blue energy engulfed the Prophet, as his displacer field overloaded. For a moment, the Prophet stood stunned. He was alive. Then the second bullet hit. It punched through the shining dome of his bald head and ended his heresy in but a split second. Each specific assassin temple focuses in on a specific discipline in the art of elimination. The Vindicare temple assassins are specialists in long-range marksmanship, cold, calculating killers that eliminate their targets with contemptuous ease. Their aim is to bring inglorious death to the enemies of the Emperor with a sniper's bullet, and focus generally on vengeance and revenge killings. Their focus is not on the suffering of their victims or the extraction of intelligence or creating a spectacle with collateral damage. The Vindicare will focus on unfeeling destruction. It is said that a Vindicare can pick out a target's jugular artery, heart or even the specifics of the brain from extreme range. No matter the complexity of the environment, Vindicares will regularly need to pick a shot through the ruins and smokestacks of an underhive sprawl. To complement their superhuman accuracy, the Vindicare Temple emphasises stealth and evasion techniques. One of the Temple's maxims is that a clean kill should only be made from the most effective firing position. It is not uncommon for a Vindicare assassin to occupy a given location for solar weeks if necessary, potentially even longer, waiting for a target to finally reveal themselves. 
the skills employed by the Vindicare Assassin's Temple will most often be used to put down those who might use social disorder and mob rule to shield themselves from heavy interjections by Arbites, although they obviously could if necessary deploy battalions of planetary guardsmen to assist if, say, the head of the snake is perhaps someone displaying the traits of a rousing orator instead of crushing the disorder with a visible force, an untraceable assassin's singular shot may well be interpreted by the ignorant pleb masses as something more akin to a divine intervention, especially if they're struck by a hellfire round, which will cause their body to be near enough instantaneously dissolved away from the inside out at horrific speed. For those watching as their glorious champion for their cause dissolves into a shambling, shrieking mess before their very eyes, panic and fear will spread just as quickly, and it's unlikely few would have the stomach to stir up trouble again after witnessing their leader disintegrate into a twitching sludge of flesh and sinew. It must be said though that seeing their false messiah's head explode as a high velocity round pops it like a ripened melon is likely equally effective. Now, as I have seen so often people noting, if the Imperium is so terrible, why don't people stand up and fight back? This is what humanity has done forever, and as I have often noted, there are an entire list of reasons as to why that is near enough impossible. One of which being that the very idea of being a rebellious figure of authority in the Imperium is a complete non-starter. Revolutionary leaders who would dare speak against the Imperium fear and know that to do so risks likely their life in a very short period of time and the lives of their comrades in very short order as well. You may think that perhaps they would become martyrs to a cause. This is possible, but in actuality likely not because Imperial Assassins have meticulously planned out their means of assassination to likely disillusion their followers. There can be little more of a disillusioning sight than their charismatic leader being eliminated by a faceless, emotionless servant of the Emperor, as if his hand had reached down and crushed the audacity of their willpower. They may attempt to rise up again, of course, and the Assassins of the Imperium will be ready to put them down again. Except that this time, it may not be a clean, cool kill from a Vindicare sniper. It may be the garroting, disemboweling, psychopathic assassins of the Eversor Temple. And after an encounter with an Eversor assassin, it is unlikely that you would see uprisings again. That's to say, if there were even anyone who lived to tell of it. But we'll return to the joyous Eversor next time. By extreme contrast, Vindicare assassins will, as they lie and wait to their victims, in fact meditate on the immortal glory of the Emperor, as, well, we all should. These elite hunters can slow down their metabolism into an almost hibernatory state. Their heart will beat perhaps only once per minute, and it's only through subliminal triggers that will enable the Vindicare to become roused instantly into a totally focused state, the instant a target shows themselves. They will lie in a near invisible state, waiting in complete silence, as motionless as a stone, before they're triggered into an ultra heightened state of focus, ready to instantly strike with absolute exacting precision and lightning reflexes. Vindicare are in fact more commonly in demand across the Imperial forces as they are quite practical for a variety of uses and are far more stable and less terrifying than the Eversaw or Calexus assassins. A Vindicare can sit back from a high vantage point as ground forces engage in a typically chaotic and most certainly brutal slaughter but finding a specific target amidst the chaos of a battlefield with all the smoke, debris and horror can be a challenging task. Quite frankly, Imperial Guard and even Astarte snipers may not be up to the task. Vindicare, on the other hand, will be able to successfully eliminate Xenos commanders or whatever their strange equivalent is, dangerously unstable psychers or other critical targets. Perhaps even seemingly loyal commanders were needed for whatever reason according to the Inquisition to fall in battle. Within the Skara sector of the Imperium, one Cardinal Zafan had found himself next in line to succeed as a member of the Ecclesiarchy's Holy Synod, the Imperial religion's ruling body. Zafan would embark upon a long pilgrimage to visit the many worlds he would soon oversee. His passionate sermons and charisma made for a popular figure throughout the Skara sector. However, quickly his presence gave rise to a fairly fanatical following, leading to a sizeable entourage of preachers, deacons, menials, and even a personal bodyguard of Adeptus Sororitas. Zafan was a fanatical devotee of the Ecclesiarchy, believing himself to be a true chosen figure, 
and this steadily became embedded in his mind, was certainly not at all helped by extreme fanatical cults like Redemptionists, who attached to his entourage exclaiming that they believed him to be upon a crusade to purge the heretics. They believed he to be sent by the Emperor himself, and could lead them all to glory. To no one's surprise, it took very little for Zafan to be persuaded into launching a war of faith in the name of the Holy Emperor, but they were still rightfully fearful of raising any suspicions of the Inquisition, and so it was that Zafan decided to organise this holy war upon the secluded world of Vrax. And as Zafan himself was heard to exclaim, the Skara Sector is a tinderbox. One spark may soon become a great conflagration, and I shall light the fires. Although welcomed by fanatical swathes of followers on arriving at Vrax, Zafan retired quickly away from the masses. His appearances would become ever rarer and fleeting. He needed to find a way to spark his war of faith, and simultaneously realised he would require far more men to achieve his holy quest than just his retinue. Although they themselves were not permitted to raise any kind of military force, in times past a cardinal had been known to raise a militia in order to protect himself and this seemed to fall within the lines of acceptability, and so they decided they would begin spreading rumours within the workforce on Vrax that the planet would soon come under threat, and these rumours spread like a fire throughout the workers. It was said that heretics were already attacking nearby systems, and that soon they would arrive on Vrax. Nearly overnight, the mood went from respectable unity to a furious witch hunt. Any who spoke out or sought to deny the Ecclesiarch's claims were demonised and either dealt with on the spot or dragged down to the dungeons of Rax. The Cardinal had become the saviour of a whole world, and he now had a zealous, loyal following that he could command against any who threatened their ambitions. Soon enough, this would include the entire military forces of Rax, with the exception of the Arbites. The penal labour forces of Vrax in their ragged clothing chained together, living lives of miserable existence, Zafan's preachers brought them hope that they could be redeemed if they joined his glorious crusade. Holy redemption and forgiveness, or a lifetime of grinding physical servitude? Hardly a difficult choice, and it further ignited the feelings of rebellion. Such unbelievably outrageous plotting was unlikely to continue unnoticed for much longer, and it was shortly after this time that the Inquisition, the Ordo Hereticus, began to take notice of the happenings on Vrax. Many of Zafan's preachings were highly disturbing, and this was for the Hereticus, in fact, not something new or unusual. They'd seen this all before. Rogue cardinals who became a little too fanatical, strayed off the path of the light, this was so often how a fall into corruption took place. It was textbook. It seemed this was all too often a very worryingly thin line between the most passionate worship of the Emperor and crossing over into becoming corrupted by the Dark Gods. These ecclesiarchy preachers, who became ever more extreme in their teachings, began to believe that they held the true power in their words, and that perhaps it was they, and not the Emperor, who deserved to be worshipped. This is the insidious way by which chaos works, Although it can take place in plain sight, all too often it happens so subtly that even those who end up corrupted are actually still completely unaware that it has even taken place. Their thoughts and feelings shift so slightly and so gradually that they likely do not even see any change in themselves. It's only to those on the outside who will see their absolute downward spiral, and by then any thought of reasonable salvation is long since extinguished. And so, this is where the Vindicare assassin enters the situation. Orders were assigned by the Inquisition that an assassin be deployed to eliminate Cardinal Zafan before things became even more disruptive and could not be solved by anything more than a total assault upon what were very quickly headed towards, if not already, full-fledged traitors to the Imperium. The assassin had lain in wait for many days, having infiltrated an Imperial citadel disguised as a pilgrim to visit relics of the Ecclesiarchy. Taking a high position above the Basilica, the Vindicare was able to see most of the grounds around, and he remained perched upon a narrow ledge, disguised by the Vindicare stealth suit, which rendered him not invisible, but extremely difficult to spot unless you were specifically looking for them. He waited, and waited. The moment would come, an instance where he could strike. He surveyed and memorised the moments and timings of the palace guard. He noted any unusual movements of preachers, visitors, the comings and goings. It was all mentally mapped out, so he knew the precise movements of all around him. A single shot ran out. A stone pillar exploded as a heavy penetrator round punched clean through the stone and straight into Cardinal Zafan. 
Unfortunately for the Vindicare, Zafan was wearing a Rosarius, and these are far from decorative items. The Starty's chaplains commonly wear these, and they gift their bearer with a powerful personal force field to prevent against exactly these kind of assassination attempts for high-ranking Imperial members. Although Vindicare are meant to have rounds which will overload these kind of personal force fields, something had gone wrong. Zafan's guards immediately surrounded him, but were instantly dead as more shots came. By now the floor was already a sea of blood, but the most important and cleanest shot had failed. The Vindicare knew the situation was already slipping away, and as he reloaded with lightning precision, he fell back into the narrow vent and was now in pitch darkness. His spy mask instantly compensated for this, giving him near daylight vision as he silently flew down the spiral staircase, which led up to this highest point of the citadel. The grounds below by now were in a mad panic, as if having kicked apart an ant's nest. Pilgrims and guards were running around in apoplectic state of shock and disbelief. The assassin burst through an arched door at the bottom of the stairwell, and as he did so he came face to face with the young preacher, who stared in a stunned silence at the black-clad imperial assassin. What was this thing before him? He had no time to think things through further, as he was instantly slaughtered by the Vindicare, firing his rifle from the hip at near point-blank range, exploding the chest of the preacher. The Vindicare dashed off to escape, but guards were swarming everywhere by now, and all doors in and out of the citadel were being sealed. Stealth was no longer an option, as the assassin shot the locks from doors and made any escape that could be found. The cumbersome large rifle was deactivated and discarded as evasion and escape became the absolute priority now. The Vindicare was now moving so fast as to be a blur to ordinary human vision. Guards made feeble attempts to fire shots at the escaping assassin, many of them found themselves bleeding out from hastily targeted shots from the assassin's Exodus pistol. Despite his best efforts though, more and more potential escape routes were being locked down and guarded by squads of men. Eventually though, making an error in a flash of what may be described as an irrational panic, the Vindicare found himself heading down into the crypts of the Basilica, and there he found quite literally a dead end. Many guard were rushing down after, and although he could put up something of a fight, grenades were already being thrown down the stone stairs in saturation. Smoke and dust filled the room, no problem for the Vindicare's visor, and he killed more guards as they made a brave effort to rush down and kill the intruder before finally the assassin was overwhelmed and pinned to the wall by fire from waves of defending guard. His shredded remains were dragged up to be paraded before the faithful. Now it's true that I might say this quite often, but this was a catastrophic failure. Not only had the assassin failed dismally in his assignment, but it had actually managed to make things considerably worse. Zafan could easily now use this as proof of his divinity, having survived an assassination attempt by the hand of the Emperor himself. It was a dismal and depressing conclusion. It was the final moments for any kind of order on Vrax. The fate of the world was sealed. Militia ran to arm themselves, looters plundered weapons and ammunition in vast quantities, and the Arbites made limited attempts to control the situation. They held out for some time, but were ultimately crushed under a weight of rampaging fanatics. The failure of the Vindicare had set in motion events that could no longer be stopped. Zafan would take control of Vrax. The Sororitas were imprisoned in the dungeons of Vrax, and Administratum Bastions were stormed. Civil war had consumed Vrax. None could escape, no loyalists would be spared. Cardinal Zafan was now in full control of Vrax. Unlikely, we can continue this story at a later time. Unsurprisingly, the core weapons of the Vindicare Temple Assassin are its Exodus Marksman Rifle and Pistol, both of which are among the finest examples of Imperial weaponsmithing. They will be meticulously crafted by an artisan of the Adeptus Mechanicus. Each rifle is part of a matched set and will be customised to the precise specifications of the individual assassin. It is said that an Exodus rifle will never jam or fail in any way, for Exodus weapons, believe it or not, are said to actually contain sophisticated machine spirits of a sleek and murderous nature, that they are even an echo of the assassin who wields the weapon. If any piece of war gear must be dumped or discarded mid-operation, which should only happen in extreme circumstances, they should be compelled to destroy the hardware, as all assassins should leave no trace unless they specifically intended to do so. It certainly wouldn't be acceptable to allow an enemy to gain access and use any piece of an assassin's equipment. Exodus weapons use highly specialised ammunition constructed from heavy gravity alloys to penetrate nearly all forms of known protection. 
it is said even enough to punch through the ceramite plate as worn by Astartes, heretic Astartes though, to be sure. The accompanying Exodus pistol is equally a masterpiece of craftsmanship, it's as elegant as it is deadly. In most situations it exists purely as a backup weapon for a Vindicare, and is primarily to be used in the rare circumstances as we just heard about when an assassin is discovered cornered or in need of rapid fire capability. Like many advanced Imperial weapons, the recoil from an Exodus pistol is such that only an assassin's enhanced musculature allows them to fire the weapon one-handed. Although likely Astartes could of course wield such a weapon, although it is hard to envision how that situation would come to pass. The Exodus pistol has a built-in silencer to enable it to be suitably compact and as with all assassin's equipment is among the highest quality weapons crafted by the artificers of the Imperium of Man, enabling any Vindicare to empty an entire clip of the pistol scoring kill after kill before their enemy have even reached for their weapons. It should also be no surprise that a long range sniper unit like the Vindicare Assassin will carry a variety of specialist ammunition. All Exodus ammunition contains miniaturised targeting machine spirits which make each round fired by a Vindicare nearly impossible to avoid. Exodus rounds can even be programmed to then self-destruct and disintegrate. These rounds will be destroyed as if by a virus leaving no trace behind. Vindicare are usually issued with their special ammunition only when being sent on an assignment and it should perhaps be obvious that these rounds are extremely extremely rare. Each single bullet is very very difficult and time consuming for the Mechanicus to craft, not exclusively but very often a Vindicare will only be given a single round of each type to complete a mission. The phrase one shot one kill was certainly never truer than for the Vindicare. Their three core types of ammunition are firstly a shield breaker round, which as we described before is used by Vindicare assassins for bypassing high value target personal energy shielding such as a conversion field or a fractor field or the Rosarius. The round overloads personal force fields and similar barriers with massive bursts of energy. The shield breaker is specially treated with a psychically charged imprint and contains a complex circuit of anti-phase technology that is little understood even by the tech priests of the Mechanicus. It's possible that it failed to kill Cardinal Zathan, having already had to break or interact with this stone pillar and thus didn't have quite enough power to break the protective field of the Rosarius. Alternately, it is possible that there was some kind of psychic interjection, who can really say? But the shield breaker will be employed against a variety of targets including protective warp fields generated by say a Tyranid Zoanthrope or an Eldar Warlock's rune armour as well as the psychic shields often employed by powerful psychers. Hellfire rounds as also earlier described have devastating effects on organic matter. Although they can be used against human targets, more often they are usually specifically used against say Tyranids. This is because the core and tip of the standard Exodus round are replaced with a vial of virulent mutagenic bioacid toxins. Thousands of armour piercing micro needles inject the target with this acid upon impact and the needles pierce the victim's flesh pumping the acid deep into the target eating away at both flesh, metal and chitin alike with truly horrific speed. Lastly we come to what is described as a turbo penetrator or a hyper velocity round. These are adamantine jacketed bullets surrounding a special magna sealed flux needle. The purpose of this is to create a two stage charge on impact to punch a diamond hard secondary round through the thickest of armour. These special rounds are renowned for their ability to pierce nearly any armour and the hyper velocity round wreaks havoc upon any target often by the secondary effect of its phasing passage through the target's molecular structure. And then finally we have the more passive war gear of the Vindicare including their stealth suit and spy mask. The Vindicare Temple has a long-standing pact with the Adeptus Mechanicus to craft their exquisite stealth suits. Each one uses Camellia line laced materials with a complex version of what is known as Sin Skin to allow its wearer to blend in with their environment. This material also connects with an assassin's body, enhancing their reflexes and protecting them from toxins, gases and other hazards on the battlefield. Each suit is supple and totally silent allowing the assassin to move with perfect freedom while still retaining both its protective and chameleonic qualities. These suits also are often genetically coded for its user and cannot be reused, although quite honestly, why would you want to? 
Lastly, the Vindicare Spy Mask is yet another sophisticated piece of gear. It's highly individualized for the wearer, and each spy mask interfaces directly with an operative's brain via neural jacks located at their temples either side of the head. The mask will then directly feed its sensory data and predictive augers into the Vindicare's mind. Trajectories, atmospherics, thermal imaging, psychic spore, all are superimposed upon an operative's field of vision. The mask allows Vindicare to see through dense smoke and obscuring screens, and can even identify weak points in their victims' defences based upon probability scripture. The quantity of information is reportedly so high that it is believed it would disorientate even a veteran space marine, but thanks to a Vindicare's mental augmatics, they're able to process it with ease. Vindicare's spy masks will also contain cartridges of highly concentrated food and water for extended operations and a multi-channel sensor for monitoring any and all enemy communications. The mask includes a built-in all-spec scanner, advanced magnification capabilities and a photo visor making the wearer immune to the blinding effects of photon flash grenades. It also contains a rebreather for hostile environments and voxcaster. As per their stealth suit, a Vindicare spy mask will also likely be gene-coded so that it can only be activated by a specific assassin, and most importantly, not be used by any enemy should they ever be in a situation to secure one. I will note that despite the lengthy description of the unforgivable failure of the Vindicare assassin upon the world of Rax, it should be generally noted that spread across the millennia, occasions which have required the dispatch of an assassin and have subsequently not resulted in the desired result are extraordinarily few. It is with fair reason that the Imperial assassins are both known through their actions and also appear in a form that resembles Death Incarnate. As the Inquisition views things, the assassins of the Imperium are able to change the fate of worlds with the pull of a single trigger, especially on worlds where the length of the Emperor's reach needs to be made abundantly clear. The weapons of Imperial assassins range from simple knives and garrots to exotic neural shredders and phase swords that can cut through armour and force field alike. Even barehanded, these operatives are lethal foes, each trained extensively in unarmed combat from their earliest inception. Upon making a return to the Temple Masters, they will be extensively debriefed and undergo a lengthy examination period before finally being given a new mark and mission to accomplish. Each serving assassin is locked into a constant cycle of hunting that will span the breadth of the Imperium until likely the day that they die. They exist to reforge the fragile threads of Imperial rule, even as the period of the late 41st millennium continues to tear them apart with an ever-increasing ferocity. In the next Assassins episode, we will learn about the recruitment and training process for Assassins. If you couldn't already guess, it involves youths being whittled down by a harrowing process, which may well seem familiar. Join me then as we learn about the arguably most traumatizing of Assassins, the Eversur. As always, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed today, please remember to hit the like. Thank you for watching me here on the channel. Stay tuned as I have other things coming up this week.